Good morning and welcome to Kingdom Ministry. Another exciting word today from the Word of God. We're excited about it. Glad to have you here. Happy Sabbath. We are here because we want to make sure that you are getting the truth, the 100% understanding, which you have to play too, but we want to give you enough to go back and study, to read, to research. So we're going to get right into the Word today. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking, so get your pen, notebook, notepad, whatever you have, get it as quick as you can. And remember, if we have any technical difficulties, we're going to log off and log right back on. All right? Because we know there are challenges to sharing the gospel of the kingdom. All right? So today, we're going to introduce another bit of material to you also, and then we're going to get right into the continuing a message that we've been talking about which is cultivating captivity part three cultivating captivity part three so get your pen paper notebook notepad ipad whatever you utilize to take notes and let's go let's go let's go father we thank you for this time together we thank you for your truth your insight and your wisdom we honor and bless you today and we ask that you watch over us change our hearts and minds that they will receive your truth and your truth alone in the name of our king we pray amen all right, so it's very important that we understand that we are in captivity. Captivity, again, doesn't just show chains on the arms and the ankles and the legs. And I know there are a lot of theological people and people who watch videos and criticize people or do research. And they talk about there are a lot of different people that were in captivity. That is absolutely true. But not to the degree that the people of the Bible, the people of the word, the people of the truth are in captivity. So I'm not saying that other cultures didn't deal with or other people of different things, but here's the thing, they were delivered by those people. And as you do research, you'll find out a lot of people who were of different complexions or nations, they were delivered by people. Uh, Israel and the nation of Israel, or the, they will not be delivered until the Messiah comes. That's just what's written in the manual, you can't change it. So I'm gonna share with you a book today, another reading, and it's called Africa's Gift to America, and it's by J.A. Rogers. Africa's Gift to America. It's a wonderful read. has a lot of information and a lot of history in here about things that went on way before we were born and things that took place. So it's an awesome, awesome material. Africa's Gift to America by J.A. Rogers. And I want, if you can, to grab that. It's the Afro-American it's Africa's gift to America, the Afro-American in the making of saving of the United States. He goes into a lot of detail about what happened. I'm gonna read a couple of pages. I'm gonna tell you what page I'm on, okay? And then I'm not gonna read the whole page, just a couple of you know, inserts and stuff that are there. On page 37, I'm gonna read, and this is concerning Patrick Henry. You remember Patrick Henry? And you talk about direct declaration of independence and all those things, Patrick Henry. And remember I told you before, and I said this, I'm just going to show you the material. If you want to go get it, you can. If you don't, it's fine. Because a lot of times people are asking, well, you know, what material are you researching? Some of, I can't put every single thing I have on here, but I'm going to give you some things to help you. I gave you some things before, and I'm going to try to do it as best I can. All right, Patrick Henry declared that while he would not and could not justify slavery, he found Negroes a necessity. I am drawn along, he said, by the general inconvenience of living without them. So he's <laughs> in his address to the Virginian Convention in June 24, 1788, he deplored the necessity of holding his fellow men in bondage, but that their manimism, or because they're human, is incompatible with the felicity of the country. So in other words, there to be even though he's against it, even though he doesn't want it, he sees the profit in it, but they're a lower class than they are. Also, he said another reason for barring Negroes, barring, which means, you know, bringing them into slavery, Negroes is the following by Earl of Egmont, who said in his journal, 1738 to 1739, where there no Negroes, a white man despises work, where there where there are Negroes, a white man despises work, saying, what, will you have me slave and work like a Negro? 
So he's identifying that the soul, one of the purpose of bringing them over was that not only would they have to do less, but that they would take on all the menial tasks and all the labors. Now I'm going to go to page 38. In 1708, Governor Cranston of Rhode Island reported that his colony had built 103 ships since, 19, since 1698 and 1749. Boston had 469 ships tied to the slave trade. That's the transatlantic slave trade. There was also a slave trade uh, after that, which we, we talk about sometime, you know, which involved the Arab, Arab slave trade. G.F. Dow has a special chapter on American ships engaged in the trade. The New England merchant says Lewis B. Wright had discovered two commodities which enriched them and their ports, rum and slaves, rum and slaves, okay? Also, he said, this, this was the procedure. The New England ships with their cargo of rum would sail to West Africa where they would exchange it for slaves and such articles they could pick up as gold, dust, and ivory. Thence to the West Indies where they disposed of them at high profit. The West Indies, you know where they're at. All right, you know that's we can consider West. That was part of Africa, and they changed the name on that later on because they took them over there. That was a training ground. But the West Indies, all those islands, were part of Africa. All right. Then return with molasses for more rum. Then again to Africa. This was known as the triangular or three corner trade. Molasses, to be it noted, was slave produced too. So he's letting you know how it worked, all right? So you understand that. I'm going to read a couple more, and then we're going to move forward. Because I want you to understand, in this book, there's a lot of different things, and these are the people who wrote this book at that time. They were living in that era. Also on page 40, it says, The War of the American Revolution really began in rivalry over the African slave trade. So the war of the American Revolution really began in rivalry over the African slave trade. So the other history books that they show you are showing you up to a point of where, this, where it started. This takes you before that and shows you why it started. So they're telling you this is why we're fighting this war. And this is showing you exactly why. Then I'm going to page 42. And then there's two more after that and we're done. Again, I'm just reading usurps. It says rum and slave trading are not glamorous and patriotic items. Therefore, most popular historians and textbooks omit them. Instead, stress is laid on the Stamp Act, which came into being to make up for the loss of revenue on the reduction of taxes on sugar and molasses. So they would always, instead of being able to identify the real reason of the slave trade or put it in the history books, they would throw the Stamp Act in there and try to divert your attention to that saying this is the reason this is the reason why we're losing money this will bring us more money instead of just you know telling the truth so let's go I'm going to go to page 44 and then one more after that I'm going to show you something John Hancock you know the one who's also on the bottom of the Declaration of Independence with John Adams and James and all those other attorneys and stuff John Hancock great patriot made his fortune as a slave smuggler F.W. Tusog, or Tusig, in Rum, Romance, and Rebellion, named several of these families. Colonial, Colonial Isaac Royal, who gave 2,000 acres of land to Harvard, made his money that way too. So they were basically uh, slave smugglers, even though they had things up front in businesses, and they were attorneys, and they were Congress, and they were part of all Parliament and all these things, they were smuggling slaves. So I'm going to go to one more and I want to show you something and then we'll move right into it. This is just a little history I like to give you uh, to show you exactly how things went back then because we don't all know, we all can't, everybody doesn't study the same way and all this other stuff and I got it. So I try to bring you a little bit of, of stuff so you can grab it and say, okay, you know, um, this is what it was like or this is what they experienced. Absolutely. Now, this is a recruiting poster that they had when they got the slaves over here and they began to you know, work for them. This is how they uh, grafted them. This is a recruiting poster of them going into the Civil War. I'm going to show this to you. This is a recruiting poster, if I can just get this up here. 
You see all the people of color on there? See that? That's a recruiting poster that they had back then. They would hang that. You know how they have the, the one today that says, you know, he, we want you. Okay, see the recruiting poster? That's what, they would, that's what they would do. That's what they would hang up. See the young man, the young black man with the drum and the rest of them? That's how they would, they would show them pictures of all of those that are now preparing to fight the war, the Civil War and different wars for them. Again, this is Africa's gift to America, the Afro-American in making and saving of the United States by J.A. Rogers. It's a very good read and I think it's very important that we understand really what happened and the value of America and what things were done and put in place so that uh, you would understand when they brought them over because remember I showed you Germany and Great Britain and France and all those things. Great Britain gave birth to the U.S. That's prophetic. That's in Revelation. And how they brought in all this to substantiate the Americas because it was really going under. And they brought this in. And, and again, you have rum, you have molasses, you have smuggling, you have all these different things. And uh, you heard some of the usurps about, you know, why should I, the, the people who were the slave owners would make statements like, why should I do work that slaves can do and all these things. So it's very important that we understand the necessity of the so-called unknown world and the role that uh, black men, black women, children, everybody played in building them up to wealth. Go all the way back to the Druids, who are the Jesuits, who run everything. I mean, that's just the way it is right now because we're in that captivity. And that's what progress is. Progress isn't things going forward. It's how to hide truth from you so you can't find it. That's why Christ, when he was talking, he said, the thief cometh not except to steal, to kill. The word kill means to push forward. The word murder is what he talks about. It. Remember in 20 of uh, when he's talking and he's at the mountain, he said, look, and he gave the Ten Commandments. He said, you shall not murder. They try to switch it to kill. But no, kill means to push forward. That's why, you know, you need a new phone, you need a new this, you need that. And you just go along with it, but you don't understand. The, the modus operandi of this government that's in place of the whole system of Satan and his children is the rich get richer and the poor get poor. The methodologies that they use are the three M's, money, mass manipulation, and media. Those Write those down, money, mass manipulation, and media. Those are the three things that the scriptures make very clear that are utilized as far as how they do it. That's why Christ said no man can serve God and mammon or money. Mass manipulation just simply means that there's an untruth out there and they keep repeating it through repetition until it becomes your truth and then the people that think like you and are, are the people that you gravitate to. That's why religion is more dangerous than truth. Religion makes you perform to a place where you try to appease a deity. Truth brings you back into line with what the original creator wanted, who was the most high. We call him God, Father, Source, and that's what he wanted. What they did was they created everything in this system to reflect false gods. That's why you have all the obelisks. That's why you have all the cities. That's why you have the names. Remember last week, uh, I saw a gentleman who uh, sent me some information on some things, on some history. Uh, some of the things the guy said was right on. Some of the things I totally disagree with because it was his personal opinion, which I stay out of that room unless we are discussing personal stuff. That's fine. But one of the things I showed you in history when Joseph was married, Pharaoh sent Joseph and said, you marry this, my daughter here, who was a priestess on, which is the sun god Ra. And he made this reference. The guy said, which was really smooth. He said, you know, that's why even in culture, they slide their words in there and their terminologies. So when you walk in the room, you don't turn the light, you turn it on on light, light, sun god, Ra. I said, wow, I didn't think of that. That I didn't think of. And that was, that was awesome because he's letting us know that in this very culture, everything you do relates to a paganistic or pagan society of the Druids, of Egypt, of uh, Satan. It's, it's all around, but it's so reinforced all the time that you think you're just doing something. And that's why here's a statement that you didn't think about before. That's why after the fall, when Adam named his wife after she declared independence from him and independence from God, he said, and Adam named his wife Eve, the mother of all living, all living. And later on when Christ is performing miracles and doing things, he's talking and they said, can I go back and bury my father? He said, let the dead bury their own. So there is, remember there are two kingdoms on the earth at the same time. There was the kingdom of death, eternal death and eternal life. And eternal life was here first. So it's important that we understand that 
And so as we begin to get more into this and understand this, you'll begin to see things in your house or things that you have or different uh, clothes and stuff that you wear that are really honoring and paying homage to idolatry and other gods. And we talked about it before, but you have to know this. You know, just like Martin Luther, you know, we talked about him being Catholic and then coming up with it, uh, with you know, with the whole uh, Protestant thing from the king who was over there and everything. Martin Luther despised the initial start of the slave trade for a minute, and then when he saw the slaves not re going toward what he thought was Christianity and Catholicism, he then encouraged more torturing of them. Do it. Re do the research. It's, it's right there. So you have to understand something. It's not that we're blaming anybody because Israel did what they did, but we're acknowledging this is what's going on according to the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, so you can get it. We are not going to sit here and justify or try to argue with oral traditions because oral traditions you can't argue with. So let's go. Daniel chapter 3. Let's pick up here where we started before. This is where we finished last time, Daniel chapter 3. Again, I'm not going to read everything out of Daniel. I, I've explained that to you before because it's not necessary because you have to do some reading too. Is Daniel a little bit heavy with prophecy? Yeah, but when you read Daniel and you read a few more things to go to Revelation, you have some understanding. You pray and ask the Father. He'll help you. In Daniel 3, this is Nebuchadnezzar having a dream of the image of gold in which you know, he's going through all this stuff and he's asking for help. I'm going to read through certain passages of this. I'm not going to read it all. It's too much, and there's no way I'm going to sit here and read all this and explain this to you today. That's not going to happen. Not because I don't want to, but this, this is good. You're going to, I'm going to leave a lot of open end today. You're going to have to do your own research, all right? Because in doing that, you'll begin to become sharper and begin to understand how to go find things. Everything is not on Google. You have to go get books. You have to go to the library. You have to research stuff. Google is a good resource for certain things, but remember, you and I don't own Google. The people who own Google, they are allowed to put certain things on there. Remember, when you control the media, you control what the masses hear because you pay for them to hear certain things. That's all it's been from day one. That's and You're going to see that as you get more and more into this, not only this message, but your own life. That's why, again, I said I can hum a tune from, if you're 30 years old or younger, I can hum a um, a melody from a song or from a TV show, if you watch TV or even music, and you'll know it. Same thing if you're 30 years old or older. It's the same thing. You've been programmed and hacked, like the rest of us in so many areas. Now we're coming against it with the truth, and you have to start with yourself. All right? Daniel chapter 3, verse 5. Let's go. New King James Version. That at the time you hear the sound of the horn, now remember, He's building an obelisk to himself. He's building a gold image. And he's saying that every time they hear certain sounds, everybody in the province is supposed to bow down and worship that image. All right? This is Nebuchadnezzar after the other dream. All right? You know, Daniel told him that his kingdom, God is revealing that his kingdom is made of gold. So, you know, a little pride jumped in there. He went crazy. And now he think he all that. So he done built the gold obelisk to himself, listening to all of his counselors. And they talking about how they need to worship him. Remember, in captivity, and I said it to you before, the people who are holding you captive see themselves as gods, even deity, and it is 100% false. All right? That at that time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Got it? That was the plan. Go down to verse 16. And this is where uh, they were, you know, doing some things. And then Ananias, Ananias Mishael, and Hazariah, they, Hazariah, they did not bow down. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these are the names that they were given, you remember by the eunuch, in slavery, answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. What happened? The king brought them to him. Let me go back to verse 12 because that way you'll get it. He says, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Remember, they were already put in position of authority. And now people are telling on them because that's what happens in captivity. The people who are holding you captive have people around them all the time working with them and they're always going to go back and tell on you. That's what happened back then. And this dispensation 
it, everything is social media, everything is cameras, everything is how to listen to you, everything is tapping in, everything is everything is everything. It's always trying to hear what you're saying. So in case you try to change the mindset or the thoughts of what they're trying to project, you become a threat to them and then they try to do things to you publicly. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today too. Because it's the same system. You have to understand, it's just that we're on the earth at this time. We're in the, it's the same system. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. So he called them before him and basically said, I'm going to blow it again, and this time you either bow or you're going to be in trouble. Go to verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So they basically told him, we're not doing it. And the king became ballistic. Now go to verse 26. And this is after they put him in the fiery furnace and they see three men they put in there and they, they see four now one looks like the son of man, son of God and all that. I'm going to skip all that because that's very familiar to a lot of you not saying it's not important. You read it in your own time. I'm going to verse 26 because I want you to see something really interesting so you won't be deceived. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near to the mouth of the burning and fiery furnace and spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of the head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not even on them. So is it possible to be in one place and be in another at the same time? Absolutely. When the power of God is there, absolutely. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated. That word frustrated in the original language that they use there basically talks about replacing. Or, you know, it doesn't just mean make mad. It, it means made his words of putting them on, or setting them on fire of no value. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that if any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall, fall, shall be made as an ash heap because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the province of Babylon. Now remember when we started, they were already in a high position in Babylon, all right? And now after this whole ordeal, he's promoting them again. Please write this down. This will help you. Promotion in captivity, promotions in captivity are still captivity promotions, not freedom. Promotions in captivity are still captivity promotions, not freedom. So it doesn't matter what company you work for, if you have you know, if you happen to work for somebody, if you got your own business, awesome. When you are promoted, you're still in captivity. So promotions in captivity are still captivity promotions, not freedom. That's not freedom. You're still in captivity. This is where they started. They did not adhere to what he wanted with the false god. They put him in the fiery furnace. The Most High delivered them. Then they were brought out and they were put back in their original positions. The difference now is he's saying anybody, Nebuchadnezzar, that speaks against this, they're not stopping worshiping him. Remember, the idol is still there. They're still not breaking the idol down. They're not removing that. He's not saying, no, I'm not the God you should worship. He's saying, no, no, just don't speak against their God or you're going to be in trouble. Because when I said something, their God came in and changed what I said, frustrated it. He's not making any changes to him or his heart toward the matter just to that moment or that event. Write this down please in your notes. Oppressors will not free you because God has done something for you. Oppressors will not free you 
because God has done something for you. There's no way he was going to free them. Remember, they were over the province earlier with Daniel with the first event. This is another event. They're now here and Daniel isn't here in this event. But yet, after everything's over, he didn't raise them up to a higher level and say, you have the authority of all us in Babylon or Chaldeans. No, you're still, you're still slaves from Judah and you just go back to your original position and just nobody speak against their God. That's it. That's it. Watch. Write this down also. God, let me read it one more time. Oppressors will not free you because God has done something for you. I'll read number one one more time. Promotions in captivity are still captivity promotions, not freedom. And finally, number three. Ready? God must destroy the oppressor and declare your freedom himself. God must destroy the oppressor and declare your freedom himself. It doesn't matter what the Emancipation Proclamation, then you have to go over and, and go over to the 13th Amendment, which once again in this country, United States declares that if you commit a crime, you can be treated again as a slave. So really, you're not free in the, in the country that you, your ancestors built. What you are is you're free to do certain things within certain statutes. And the moment you violate your statutes, you lose your rights as a citizen. That's what felonies and everything's for. When you do the study on hysteronics of what's going on, history of, of everything in the United States, and you go back and see how the mass uh, plan to indoctrinate or to sub separate the families and the culture of family has been pushed, man, right before during the time of Queen Isabella and Ferdinand with Columbus faking that he discovered America. I mean, in the history books it shows it, but if you get the books before that, it shows you in the nautical, uh, nav in the nautical navigational books, it shows you that not only did they not discover America, but they came over here for gold, molasses, rum, and that Gad was already over here in America, which was Native Americans. So when you do that and you understand how it worked, you'll see the whole plan works together, the whole system to make sure that everyone believes one thing while they're running everything behind it to keep the chaotic system going. That's what Christ kept saying. He kept explaining to them that this isn't real. He said, this isn't real. This is not the way the kingdom works. But they wouldn't listen just like people don't listen today because religion is more appealing. Because religion allows you to do anything you want to do because grace will cover you. But here's the issue. If you go back to Genesis chapter 6, I'm sorry, chapter 11, with the Tower of Babel, that was the induction of a one world religion. And that's why God stopped it. He said, no, let me have them speak different languages so that they can't understand each other. Why? Because a one world religion does not place the father at the head. It always places a man. Religion always has a man as the head. And that's not the way it works. Christ is the head. The father is the head of everything. That's why it clearly says, that the head of Christ is the Father, or God. The head of man is Christ, and the head of woman is man. That's order. And what they do in religion, if you think about it, who's the head of religion? Just think of any religion. Think of Christianity. It's the leadership of the churches. It is not, they don't, they don't teach you that Christ is the head. They teach you that Christ is the sacrifice. They keep showing you to him on a cross, being crucified. They don't teach you that he is the head. They don't teach you that he's the head. They teach you that the apostle, the pastor, that's why most people preach. They don't teach out of the law and out of the gospels. They teach Paul. Paul is not a gospel. That's why they call him the Pauline letters. They've given Paul more teachings than they do Christ. Christ is throughout every place. He's in Proverbs. He's in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, John, Jewish, Jewish, everything. He's all there. But they teach more Paul. They teach that. So when it comes to the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all point back to the original text. And then Paul, when he comes, he points back. Paul is, didn't save anybody, and he can't save anybody. He himself needed saving. So it's important that we understand that religion makes a man. Catholicism, who's the head of the Catholic Church? We talked about it earlier with Martin Luther and stuff, and, and you know Henry VIII making a new pope because he wanted to divorce because the Catholics didn't divorce back then, and the whole Asia area over there was Catholic. We talked about that before and how, you know, Duke of Canterbury became the Pope and division of the Catholic Church, which became the Protestants, the Anglicans, 
uh, the Episcopalians and all the rest of them, and the Christians. So the head of that is the Pope, the head of when you start dealing with China and Buddha, it is Buddha, and then you have to go back and find out where it came from. And then the same thing with Seven Day Adventists, same thing for all the other religions, it's always a man, it's man-made. And the Father's not gonna allow that. And that's why it's important that you understand religion is easier to get into because it tickles your fancy. It makes you feel good with your five senses. There's no responsibility. All you have to do is listen and go with the flow. That's the most dangerous thing in the world. So. Let's move forward into uh, a little bit of where we're at. We're not going to get so much in the prophecy. I'm going to speed up here because I want you to um, stay, you know, we're going to stay on task today. And I'm not going to go too fast. We have, you miss everything, but I'm going to speed up a little bit. Go to Matthew 24. I explained to you that we're going to talk about what's, where we're at and what's coming because you need to understand what the Messiah said concerning what's going to happen in these last days. And remember, the moment Christ was taken up into heaven, the moment he lifted up and went on that cloud, the last days began. All right? Matthew 24, verse 3. Now, as he sat at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, remember, this wasn't a public event. This was privately saying, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Remember, they're asking him, what's going to happen? What are we supposed to look for to show us that you're coming? And verse 4, all right? And... He answered, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying that I am the Christ. That's the anointed one. Remember Christ, Christo, Messiah, Messianic. It means Messiah. It means the anointed one. Anointed one. All right? He's the Messiah. He was born for this. And will deceive many. And you will hear. So he's not saying he's going to deceive a few. So when you hear all these people talking about my anointing, how God sent me, now I have to preface this because I said it before, and I'm not saying it to hurt anybody, I'm just saying it because it's the truth. There is no deliverance ministry, and I say that because I hear that so much. People say, God has called me for deliverance ministry. Listen, nobody saw more miracles than the children of Israel in the wilderness. Even Christ saw the miracles, they're not recorded because the scripture said there's not enough books. So it doesn't mean he didn't do more, but they saw him right in front of him, left, right, right, left. Christ cast out demons. He did all that. He raised the dead. He did all that. Here's the key. Remember, Israel was in captivity. Did he deliver them? So if you say you have a deliverance ministry, then you better make sure that you're letting people out of bondage and captivity when it happens. Because otherwise, you don't have a deliverance ministry. That's something you made up because it's a slogan that was slipped into religion, and people run with it, and then they laugh at it because you've been programmed and hacked to believe that that's okay to say. But remember, the verbiage, the language, what we see, how we dress, what we do, it's all in related to a satanic system. And that's why even our dress in Leviticus, the father said, let a man adorn himself as a man and the woman not adorn herself as a man and let a man not adorn himself as a woman. Because even back then they were doing it. They were exchanging clothes. They were having different ritualistic sacrificial clothes they would wear to sacrifice with pagan gods. Um, it's, it's all there. You just have to read it. It's all through there. So Christ did not deliver them at the time. What he did was he took away the animal sacrifices and the things that, that was hurting them that would not allow them to get into the Holy of Holies. So again, am I talking about casting out demons and raising the dead, the power that God does? No, I'm not mentioning that. I'm saying you're walking around saying you have a deliverance ministry. Really? Then if a person is delivered from something, then how are they going back? If you say it's your ministry, you can't deliver nobody from nothing. It's the power of God. If they're delivered by that way, that's what delivered Israel from Egypt, the power of God. So I don't care how many religious people you listen to, listen to the verbiage. That's what Christ is saying. Many shall come saying, I got this ministry on me. Is it aligned with what's written or is it man-made? You have to know and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Verse 6, see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines. You know what famines is? That, you know, lack of food, food shortages. You, you see a lot of that going on. It's been going on. It's going to increase. All right? There will be um, famines, pestilences. What is a pestilence? Please write the word pestilence down. I'm going to give you the definition. Pestilence. Any infectious or contagious disease and any epidemic disease with a high death rate. Pestilence. Any infectious or contagious disease 
Also, any epidemic disease with a high death rate. One more time, what is pestilence? Any infectious or contagious disease that would include everything that's going on now, STDs, everything, HIV, everything else, and any epidemic disease with a high death rate. So Christ is saying there's going to be famines, pestilences, earth, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Now, he also says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. What is tribulation in this meaning here? Tribulation, please write it down. The word tribulation means pressure, anguish, and persecution. Pressure, anguish, and persecution. You know there's pressure everywhere. Families, from husband to wife, uncle, father and mother. You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. And people are pressuring you to make decisions through fear, through doubt. See, here's the thing. Faith can't be manipulated by religious antics. When you hear people say, well, I got faith whether I do this or not. That is not true. That is a lie. Because remember, the opposite of faith is unbelief. So if that's the case, if I do something in fear and call it faith, is it faith or is it unbelief? So you don't want to hear that because you think, well, my faith is in God, but I'm going to still do this. Well, that's your philosophy, but that's not what faith is. Because the writer said faith is the substance of things hoped for, which means faith is already finished. And the writer said by faith, the worlds were framed, which means the world isn't unframed. It's framed and it's going to hold. That's what faith is. Faith is a finished product. Faith is not a manipulating product. Faith doesn't come in. That's why Christ would always ask when Jesus, who is on the earth, he said, do you believe that I can do this? Because Isaiah had already spoke that that's something he would do, that he would heal us, that he would heal us. So if that's the case, then if you're trusting the Father for your healing, then why are you falling back to another place and calling it faith? Now, I'm not omitting medicine. I'm not, I'm, I'm not omitting that you need, some people need to take medication. Some people need to change their diet and eating and stuff. I'm not omitting any of that. I don't put everybody under the same umbrella and throw it. We have to separate things according to how it's done. Revelation says those that practice witchcraft and pharmacia. Pharmacia is where we get the word pharmacy. That's those medicines with all those different side effects that you hear about. You can take this, but it may cause blindness, may cause deafness. You may get dizzy. Don't eat, don't do this. Listen, the scripture is clear. Those things are not good for you. So what we have to do is eliminate what we've been doing so we don't need them. You have to make changes in your diet and your habits. And it's challenging sometimes, I got it, but that's the only way. So tribulation is pressure. Pressure is always going to come from things being repeated to you. You need to do this, you need to do that. And then anguish, and then persecution. He said they would deliver you up to tribulation, pressure, anguish, and persecution, and kill you. And you will be, and kill you. Let me say it again, and kill you. So you can understand, it's in your manual. And kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Watch this now. I'm going to keep reading. And then many will be offended. Offended. What does that word offended here mean? That word offended means scandal. It means to scandalize. That word offended here means to scandalize, to entrap, or to entice to sin. To scandalize, to entrap, or entice to sin. To scandalize, to entrap, or to entice to sin. You know, when you see scandals on TV, that means that a lot of gossip people are saying stuff about you and they make up false things to say this is true. Here's the false evidence. We have proof. And most of the time it's a scandal, scandalized. But if they repeat it enough in the media, people believe it. So they discount you as being less than this and that, you know, not going with the flow, not being part of the team, troublemaker and all these things. That's exactly what they did with Christ. Remember, when they took him before the Romans, they said, what did he do? And they examined him. They said, he's not broken any of our laws. They said, you judge him. They said, we don't have a law to judge him. So they started to scandalize his name. And, that, and they got to the point where he said, hey, he calls himself a king. And that's what we're going to tell you. Remember, that's the highest thing they could say. And they weren't saying anything bad because at the end, remember at the end when he's on the cross and he's, Christ is being crucified, they came back to Caesar again. I mean, sorry, to Pilate, not Caesar. I apologize. They came back to Pilate again. And they said, because Pilate had written on the sign, King of the Jews. 
They said they came back. These are religious leaders, the people who were scandalizing him. They said right on there, he said he's the king of the Jews. Why? Because when you add a different word to an existing truth, you change the existing truth from its core. So they wanted him to say, he say, because you remember earlier when Christ was talking, he said, my testimony is not valid. You see? He said, if I just boast about myself, it's not valid. He said, it's the Father who spoke about me. And then when they had him before the council, they, they said, what do you say that you spoke? He said, ask the people who heard me what I talk. You see, when you, that's why when he said, many shall come in my name, Christ, how many people out there boasting about their ministry, how deep they are, how God used them? He's warning you right there. Don't listen to people that got, that's all boasting about them. He said, they're, they're, those are dangerous people. So they only had one thing to go on, and they had to tell the truth. He said he's a king. He calls himself a king. Now, they didn't say he was our king, though he was. And that's when Pilate said, what? And then they said, the religious leaders who are part of Israel, the Pharisees said, we have one king, Caesar. In other words, they were saying, it looks like we're with them, but our allegiance is really with Rome. Come on, how many times do you know people that look like they're with people in the scriptures, but their allegiance is really with the opposition or the people who are oppressing them. That ha that's happening today. There are a lot of places and people who are teaching and doing things. They're not teaching the Bible. They don't know the Bible. They're teaching their emotions. They're teaching out of feelings. They're teaching people into bondage. They're teaching people into captivity. And Christ said these things would happen. And they're telling people, this is what you need to do to do this. You know, I believe God wants you to do this. Really, show me in the manual what God wants me to do that. Well, I'm just saying, you know, I believe it. Or they come with all this stuff. And that's why I said, you better be careful. Because, now, nah, you know, I'm just going to tell you the truth. The Bible is the truth. And when the Bible says that a bishop should have one wife, one wife, a bishop should be able to run his own house, be respected and honored in his own house, and be a man of integrity. Then how in the world are you ordaining all these female bishops throughout the world? How is that possible? Because in religion, they can do what they want. But in the kingdom, a bishop is a male. There is no female bishops in the kingdom. Not in Christ's kingdom. In the kingdom as a country. You better start understanding what he said. So on that day, you won't hear, I never knew you. Because all these little slogans and religious things that you're saying, because you want to fit in with the out crowd. Now I got, there's a lot of people who are in bondage, don't know the truth, and you want to share it with them. And you can't just dump everything on them because they won't hear it. I got it. But don't you conform to them. The writer said, be not conformed to this world. That word means similar. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You hold true to what is written. You don't conform to them. When the apostle Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might win some, he did not compromise. He did not say, in other words, he broke the language down so they could understand it. He didn't water it down or take it away. That's what a lot of these new translations of the Bibles are doing. They're taking words out of the Bible that you will no longer have the effect that God wanted in the beginning because they're man-made, they're translator-made, they're not spirit-led, they're not spirit-led. Let's move on. That's some good stuff right there. Glory to the Most High King. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, verse 10, and then many will be offended, remember, scandalized, entrapped, and enticed to sin. In other words, you're so hurt, you're so frustrated, you ain't get your place, nobody celebrating you, I'm going to just leave what I believe and I'm going to join a cult. I'm gonna join. You know, one guy said this, and you check this out. This is your, your, look up the word occult. He said the word occult means hidden. means hidden. So it's a hidden society and hidden groups and hidden cultures. Ezekiel talks about that. It's throughout the Bible with hidden groups and cultures and uh, seances and witches and warlocks and groups that you are going, you do different uh, sacrifices to with children and animals and goats and Wicca and different things like that. All that's in the scriptures. Check it out. Secret societies and cultures and groups. So offended. A lot of people are recruited from religion. Remember, the process is this, and this is so simple. Remember, we talked about it last time in part two. We are being hacked. When you constantly in this situation, they have to come and test and see. It's not a test. It is a what? Remember, there's a difference between a test, God tests, but he will not tempt. So they tempt you to see in this society, in this culture, if they can bring you in and recruit you into Satanism. And a lot of people say that they're serving God in religious institutions, 
but then go join these secret societies privately. This is not new. The priests were doing it from Israel for a long time until God addressed it and told them if they didn't stop it. That's why when you are a prophet and you have the office of a prophet, if you are a male, you are a prophet. If you are a female, you are a prophetess. One of the major things that prophets do is expose sin or remind them of God's laws and what they should be doing and things that God commanded. That's what prophets do. It's to bring order according to the laws, precepts, and concepts of the kingdom, not your personal view and your own words of edification and all. No, you, that's not what it's about. You have to understand what it is. And that's why I say I don't do a lot of teaching on prophecy right now because a lot of people's brains are twisted because many false prophets have come and given them false words. They're, they're going to palm readers. They're going to different people. They're having crystal balls. They're bringing stuff in their house. They go on to so-called church on Sunday and then they're going home and they're reading tea leaves and all these things and yet they say it's culturally related. No, that's really, that's true, just captivity. That's the culture of captivity because there was no tea leaves reading and stuff going on in Israel at that time in the Israelites or Jacob or anything like that and it wasn't going on at all with them. What they did was they adopted that from that other culture because God told them don't go with them. All right? So you have to deal with it. If you're still practicing these things, you need to repent and come out of that because those things are a way of eternal damnation and God will judge that. Not only judge it, there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, but there is condemnation. He will judge the world for what they did not do according to his laws and precepts. That's why he said, my sword is in his mouth. Those are his laws. Those are his laws. Okay. So, it's important. Offended. Scandalized. So when you stand up against any system, they're going to try to scandalize your name. They're going to try to entrap you, make you offers of money, you know, position and stuff, and they're going to entice you to sin. What is sin? Breaking God's law. So they're going to tell you, it's okay. God understands. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Don't do it. All right? Let's continue on. And he said, then many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. Verse 12. And because lawlessness. Now, in New King James Version, like I told you, they have some errors here too. That's why I'm, we're going to go back to the original King James very soon. This word lawlessness here, and the translator translated, it's not the word lawlessness in the original writings. It's the word iniquity. It's the word iniquity. Because when you understand it, I understand lawlessness. You know, lawless one is what Satan is called. Because the Bible tells you that iniquity was found in him, so you have to know how to put it together. But I want to give you the original words so you can understand it. He said, because lawlessness, which is iniquity, will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So he's saying, remember, iniquity is the hidden sins of the heart. You can't see iniquity publicly. You can see breaking the, the sin. You can see sinning. If the writer said, Exodus 20, you shall not steal, and you go out and steal, you can see you stealing. You can see you steal. I mean, it's not a problem. You, you see, if that's not your car and you take it, you've stolen. If that's not your shoes, whatever, you've stolen. It's not your, you know, mint, you've stolen them. You've taken them without permission, you, you, you are, you're stealing. But now what's in your heart that's building are hidden things you can't see, which now cause your habitual behavior or habits to form. So by breaking the law, you form new habits. That's what rehabilitation is. That's why, now, now, you remember manipulation of words, that's why they call reformation. It's reforming your thinking. There was no freedom in it. Look, that's why in the culture of how to continue to move forward, one of the things you do is, you, as we talked about earlier, you separate the family. You have mass incarcerations of all people of color. And that's just the way it is and was and still going on to destroy the family concept and the family foundation so that when they come out, they are afraid of society and they feel more comfortable being incarcerated so they commit another crime. And the crime they commit because of pressure. You see, I gotta have money, I gotta have diapers, I gotta have this. And most of it is male. That's why when you do the study on how many males and how many females of color have taken plea bargains from public defenders, the numbers are staggering. Because they'll tell you, if you go to trial, this is what it's going to be. So, what's the key? First of all, we pray for them and their families. Second, we reintroduce God's laws to them. When you reintroduce God's laws to them in their mind and their heart, and they begin to understand what God is saying, 
then you won't steal. Is it going to be easy? No. Because remember, you still have a system out here that's trying to hack them every day. Hack them. Hack them. Tell them what they're not. Tell them what they can't be. They're putting them in pressure situations. They're putting them in big, big pressure cookers and impoverished areas. And they're telling them what they're not. And they're letting them be drug dealers and drug pushers to each other. And they're killing each other. And they're doing all these things constantly. And they're hurting each other and destroying each other and hating each other and having kids and not doing anything. But the reality is this. When it was we were all working together when they came over and they started forming Wall Streets and corporations and companies, it was immediately abolished and destroyed and even bombed because they realized that any time you get people together that think outside of the system we put them in, we have to eliminate them. And that's the culture of Satan, the Druids, the Satanic system, religion, and all of it. It all works together. It's not a separate system. Each, system. each part of the system has a role to play. Just like later on, when, when Christ was talking and he was educating them concerning each one of the roles, he said, I've chosen 12 of you, and one of you is the devil. Got it? So each one, Matthew, a tax collector, Peter, a fisherman. Do you understand? Andrew, a fisherman. So they had different roles, but he brought them together because each one had a different role, and they were still in captivity. But yet Judas who was in captivity but had rights as a free man because his father was also a Pharisee and he was next in line for pharmaceutical. That's why if you notice in the writings, he would always go to them. He would always commune and share with them. And that's why during the time of Passover in which Christ said, whoever dips in after me, he said, whatever you do, do quickly because he understood that his heart was with the Pharisees though he was with you. That's the same thing today. There are a lot of people who have services or churches and they're not teaching and preaching the kingdom. And that's what Christ preached. We'll talk about that again very soon. Christ preached the kingdom and then signs, wonders, and miracles took place. They're not preaching the kingdom. So people go in there, find out the weakness of them, and they go back and report to the people who want to influence or have influence in that culture or that church or that building. It happens all the time. Look, the writer said this. He said, that there are wolves in sheep clothing and he said many antichrists have already gone out into the world that's what was said concerning what would happen in the latter times again we're not going to get into everything but that's what happens so there's some people that are coming to sit in just to draw other people away from you that's why the writer said satan himself walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour that word devour means drink down he wants to see who he can manipulate and pull out of there and have take his side because of how they feel, because you're not celebrating them, because you're not honoring their gift, because you don't make them feel of value. Got it? So that's what's going on. Let's go to James chapter 4. Oh, we're almost done. I'll tell you, this is some good stuff. This is some good stuff today. I pray you're getting something out of this that you can grab and go back and study and research and just check your life. Again, you can't force people to do anything. There's a lot of people out here who are taking shortcuts, and that goes for everybody, clergy and all of them. You don't sit here and fool yourself. There are a lot of clergy out here who say they're preaching and teaching right and living double lives with wives and other kids and doing all kind of stuff, but there are a lot of people out here doing things right. You, there are a lot of things out here, people out here with a lot of integrity doing things right, and they're trying to keep the Sabbath. They're trying to understand the holy days. They're trying to make sure that they stay in line with what the Father wants and obey Him, not like the ancestors did. All right, James chapter 4. Watch this. We're going to start in verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Watch this. Do they not come from your desire for pleasure? That war in your members? You lust and do not have because you're in captivity. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. How do you murder someone? You have to first hate them. You hate your brother. You can't inherit the kingdom if you hate your brother. Christ said this. You cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven if you hate your brother. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. I'm going to stay here. Covet means to see something. We talked about in Proverbs before. Don't envy the, the oppressor. Cars, Cadillac, gold, Rolexes and all this stuff. And you trying to obtain it by selling drugs to your own people and killing them because they stepped on your shoe or all this stuff. He said, you're not supposed to be doing it. He said, why are you doing that? Because there's wars inside of you because of the iniquity that's in you. Watch. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. In other words, you're missing it. 
it's not supposed to be all yours because you just want to be seen because you want to fit in with the bling bling crowd. Crowd. He said you're supposed to ask and get it together and be a person of integrity so you can help other people, help other people get out of their funk and out of their mess. Remember, it is possible in captivity to come to, for God to help you. It is possible because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You got other things going on and God's not going to trust you if it's all about you. Now, adulterers and adulteresses, so he's talking male and female. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity? Remember that word enmity talks about a war and doesn't end with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? In other words, God's not going to allow you to serve two masters, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He's telling you a key in captivity. You got to resist this stuff. Yeah, there's going to be challenges. Yeah, some things you did, old habits, they're going to try to come up. Yeah, people are going to call you and talk about the good old days. He says, you're going to have to resist now. You're going to have to resist. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does double-minded mean here? Two-spirited or vacillating. Two-spirited or vacillating. All right? So he said, purify your hearts, you double-minded, two-spirited. I'm serving God over here, but over here I'm serving my own secret society and culture. And I'm vacillating. I'm supposed to be so-called saved and following the law, but over here I'm doing what I want to do and I'm watching things and doing things and I'm doing stuff I'm not supposed to. See, it's very confusing sometimes when you try to come out of bondage when you don't understand you're in bondage. Because a lot of things in culture that we practice and, and our ancestors practice, we never, God never required of us. And so a lot of the things are culturally related to pagan worship. Verse 9, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He's saying you got to be able to say, I'm not right. I'm not getting it. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do and I'm compromising in some areas. And until you decide that's what you're going to do, that's, the, that's kind of like the cry to say, I need help. That's the cry to say, look, I'm, I'm not getting it all the way and I know it, but I need some help. What is he saying? You got to humble yourself. You got to acknowledge, look, I've been taking shortcuts. I've been living two lives. I've been doing this thing because Christ said these are the things that's going to happen in the last days. These are the things that you're going to see. Well, we're reading it. Here's the question. Post this everywhere. Everybody just post, 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 share. Are these things you're practicing, but yet you're saying you're waiting for the Messiah to come? Remember, Job said it's a great and terrible day of the Lord. Great for those that are getting up in the resurrection of life. But then the next passage, he said, are you really sure you want that to come? So that's a big, quite good question because he's telling you, as it gets closer to the coming of the Messiah, they're going to put more pressure on believers and those that are in covenant with Christ to hang in there and to stay faithful. That's the same thing Nebuchadnezzar was doing. Because when he heard about his kingdom and how great it was, he built that whole obelisk and said, now worship me. What do you think they're doing in these cultures? They're not telling you to remember the Father, to pray and stuff. They're telling you, hey, we're your God. We have your solution. We know what's going on. That is Satan himself, because you remember what he told the Messiah. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all this. That's what they're saying. Now watch, John 15, book of John, chapter 15, book of John, chapter 15, and we're going to go to verse 18. Book of John, chapter 15, verse 18. It says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world, watch this, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, but I chose you out of the world, but I chose you out of the world, in him he chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, Ephesians. But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, if that's the case, then how do we make up this doctrine that God loves everybody when the Bible clearly says, Jacob I love, but Esau he hated. 
So if that's the case, Christ is saying here, this is the Messiah, this is him, in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So he's telling you, this is powerful for the course. The world hated me because I am a king and I am the Christ and I am going to rule and reign here, period. The world system, the whole world, the governments, all of them, they hate me. Watch. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. So the reason they're rejecting and not really too uh, you know, happy about you or really care about you is because of this. Yet because you are not of the world. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So he's telling you, they're hating you because they know I chose you. See, we have to deal with what he's saying here. He's saying they hate me. So anyone that's committed to me and affiliated with me, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Naphtali, Joseph, all that, anybody affiliated with that, they're going to hate you too. So understand this. They're not hating you because you're deep, because you got all this revelation. It's because you've committed to obey the Father and his king, the king and the kingdom. You want to love the Father, and Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what the Father was saying. God said, if you love me, obey me. So when you obey the things of God, the world hates you because they're trying to convince you openly and overly a hundred zillion times as they can in your life, go against it. Go against it. Enjoy life now. Have fun now. Enjoy everything now. Have great fun now. You're like, but understand this. They hated me too. Revelation 2. Let's go. And close it out for today. Revelation chapter 2. Oh, what's coming? Oh, we're going to talk about what's coming really quick here. Revelation 2, chapter 9. Oh, let's start in verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, which is Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. We know what that is. Verse 9. I know your works. Tribulation. Remember the word tribulation? Pressure, anguish, and persecution, and poverty. But you are rich. You're only poor because you're in captivity, and the captives, you'll never be equal to them. Doesn't matter what you do. They're going to do everything they can to take every dime you have. That's why when you get money, you're supposed to help other people move forward together. Because it's easier to move as a family than it is as an individual. But we'll talk about that another time. That's why the writer wrote how beautiful it is. The, for the oil that runs down the beard of Aaron. He's talking about the unification of the family of the Most High. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. See that? A synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember who are the church. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So he's saying, they're going to put pressure on you, you're going to do more. Now again, this is in the manual. I didn't write it, you didn't write it. He's saying as they see you staying consistent in serving God, they're going to put more pressure on you from these synagogue of Satan people. Synagogue of Satan, these are fake Jews. They are not Israelites. These are fake ones. All right? They're saying they are, but they're not. And this is what the scripture says. Remember, right here, synagogue of Satan. It says, and, and I'm reading it again in verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So he's saying they're fake. They're, they're blaspheming and they're fake. Let's go to Revelation 6. Oh, we got to end really soon. There's so much I want to share with you. But we're going to end it right after this. Revelation 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out. I'm sorry. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer 
until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So he's saying there is a specific number of martyrs, they call it, use the word martyrs, that are in the world that are not going to compromise and give up and cave in, that are going to be killed. And they're going to receive this white robe. And the ones who preceded us, the forefathers who preceded us, who were killed, and he, this is why he said, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. In other words, the laws, the precepts, and concepts that they kept. And the other oppressors that oppressed them during the different times they were in captivity, they killed them because they would not serve their gods. And he's saying it's nothing new. Re history repeats itself. And he's saying to those that are under the throne, the souls, hold on because you have brethren and other servants that are going to be joining you. I have to wait for them to come, but I'll give you your robes now and they're going to be killed just like you were. Right here, it's in your manual. Verse 11, then white robes were given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So there's going to be quite a few that are going to be crying out and getting a lot of these white robes. All right? But it's, it, Christ is saying these things are going to happen and he's showing them to John here also. Let's close out Revelation 22. Everybody should know what that is. If you don't, before you get to your index, and before you get to your other part, the last part here, with appendices and all this stuff back here and all this different things and little dictionaries if you have them. Revelation 22. We're going to park here. This is it for today. Verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. Watch this. And I give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. Remember Adam had that until he broke the law, until he rebelled independently, and they, God put an angel in front of that, the tree of life, to guard it with the sword. You remember it's back in Genesis. And may enter through the gates into the city. Verse 15, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral, immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So the lie is religion. The lie is to keep living the same thing after hearing the knowledge of the truth, of the real truth about the kingdom that you go right back and you stay in that lie. Everybody, and I'm going to say this clear, I'm going to say it slow. Everybody is going to be judged. Everybody is going to be, going to be before the throne. Everybody is going to heaven. But there are different aspects of heaven with the ruling class and there are different gates to walk through with the 12 tribes and there are different access points for those who are faithful and there are different people or different way God has set it up. But then there's outside in which you're going to have servants, you're going to have eternal death, you're going to have different things. It's all in the manual. So verse 15 again. But outside, this is outside of the kingdom. But outside are dogs and sorcerers. The word dog sometimes in the Greek refers to male prostitutes. You look it up. It refers to male prostitutes. Outside are dogs and sorcerers. That would be witches, witchcraft, soothsayers, those that practice all this stuff. And sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters. And whoever loves and practice a lie. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Glory to the Most High the bright and morning star, and the spirit, watch this, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So he's saying there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to be happening really fast soon, and don't you believe that your captors are trying to help you? That's what he's saying. They're going to put pressure on you. They're going to do a lot of things. They're going to put you in jail, bring you before a lot of people. And one passage, he said, don't even worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you what to say at that time. But I'm just letting you know it. When you hear people saying, it's going to get better, all these false prophets. Things are about to improve. Yeah, when Christ comes and free us, free all the, uh, the world from being in bondage to sin, 
But until that time, no, because no man shall redeem us. No man. That's why it's going to take a king, the Christ. So it's important. Man, what a good word today. Because we got to get ourselves ready mentally and we got to prepare to stay in the word and in prayer. And we have to continue to encourage each other as you see the day approaching. Thank you for your time. Father, I pray that this word is not stolen from these, your sons and daughters, and that they examine their lives in the perfect law of liberty, and that they look and see where they're at, and they make the necessary changes without making excuses, that they confess, they agree with, and they admit it. If they're living two lives, they come out of that falsehood and fallacy and religion, and that they adhere to your truth and your truth alone, that they may see and live and live according to how you would have them. You didn't send us here with a title. You sent us here with a purpose. And the purpose is to serve you with all of our heart and to love you and your commandments. For in them we find life. And that life is the light of men. That word life means laws, commandments, truth, eternal life. That's why Christ said, I have come that you may have life. What did he bring us back? The laws, the commandments. Glory to his holy name. So be it, Father. Amen. Thank you for joining us again today. Man, what an awesome teaching. Post this thing. Go back and study this. Look, it's it's happening as we sit here. You see all the pestilences in the world. You see all the things going on. It's not just in one place. It's everywhere. What does that mean? It means Christ is telling you this is the beginning. It's not the end. It's the beginning. These are stages. Boom, 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 boom. So right now, while we can still talk this way, while we can still meet this way, while we can still gather the way we're gathering, pray. Ask God, what is your role? Get out the religious title thing and all that stuff. What is my role here in the earth and my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? First and foremost, learning the laws and the precepts and obeying him and keeping his commandments. For this is the duty of man. Have a wonderful day. Oh, remember, if you're sending us letters, P.O. Box 19050, P.O. Box 190575, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33319. All the rest of the ways to give, you know, I see them all the time and they're, they're posted. May the Father keep and watch over you always. So be it. Have a great Sabbath.